Welcome to the Metropolitan Club. I am Kelly Atkinson, a member of CMC's Board of Trustees and Office Administrator of Barnes & Thornburg's Downtown Law Office. It's great to see you all today. Today's forum, Strong Leadership, Strong Girls, is brought to us in partnership with Girl Scouts of Ohio's Heartland and the Women's Fund of Central Ohio. Won't you please help me thank them? Women gained the right to vote in 1920 with the passing of the 19th Amendment, yet progress and equality for women and girls is an ongoing journey. We are better as a nation and as a society when women have access to equitable health care, leadership positions in the workplace, and equal pay for equal work. Let's learn more from some strong women who know. Please help me welcome Interim CEO of Girl Scouts of America, Sylvia Acevedo, and host, former Ohio Supreme Court Justice, Yvette McGee-Brown. <laughs> Sylvia will make opening remarks and then join Yvette for some conversation. Sylvia, the podium is yours. Hey, thank you very much. And thank to all of you for making time out of your busy schedule to come here. Um, I don't know if you know, but we're having our convention in Columbus in October 2017. Oh, Tammy's showing, yes. And we're just absolutely thrilled. Um, you're living in Columbus, so you don't realize outside of Columbus, this is a hot city. I mean, people are talking about it. Um, you know, three years ago when we announced it, people go to Columbus. But now people are like, oh my God, we get to go to Columbus. So um, we know that there's going to be well over, you know, 10, 15,000 people that are coming just for the convention. And, you know, just to give you a sense, um, that's bigger than a women's final four. All right, so it's a big economic impact, and we're just really excited. And I will tell you, you all have been so amazingly gracious and welcoming. We are thrilled to be here. Now, um, also, you know, you might have seen, and there's a troop out there selling Girl Scout cookies. All right, and um, I want to talk to you about this program just really quickly in terms of my remarks. Do you know this is an $800 million business? It's the second largest cookie business in America, second only to Oreo, and we do it in three months. I know that is pretty amazing, right? And the money, and the money stays local. So you actually, you're doing really good when you buy these cookies, right? Um, but what I wanna talk about is the impact of that program. The impact of the program is just wide and extensive. Half of America's female entrepreneurs, successful ones, were Girl Scouts. 80% of America's CEOs, they were Girl Scouts. And I know for me, selling Girl Scouts changed my entire view of opportunity. I grew up in southern New Mexico, very humble circumstances, and I got into Girl Scouting. And I was really excited to be part of Girl Scouts. And when I saw all the activities we could be part of, I stayed back and I talked to my troop leader and I said, you know, I can't participate. And she said, why can't you participate? I said, because my family can't afford these things. And she said, don't worry, you're gonna sell cookies. <laughs> and and, and uh, then she explained that what we do is we, we set goals, you make decisions, basically you create a, a marketing plan, then you have to go and ask for the order, you have to deliver on your order, you have to say please and thank you, and then you have to deliver the money in as well, so there's a the business ethics as well. But what was mind-blowing for me and forever changed my view is if you are somebody in poverty, you come at the world in a mindset of scarce resources and scarcity. And with Girl Scouts and selling cookies, I realized you create your own opportunity. You can do that. And that forever changed my outlook in life, that I realized it's within my power to create my own opportunities. But then in addition to this, it taught me one of the best sales techniques that I still use to this day. My troop leader said, something else, never leave a sale, side of a sale, until you've heard no three times. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> I think about it, so the first sales that you're doing, right, that's to your friends, your family, your church members, right? And everybody looks at you and says, of course, I'll buy cookies. But then you start knocking on doors or talking to people you don't know. And there comes that moment when somebody says, no, thank you. And I remember I, I stood there and I thought, I can't, I can't leave. 
because my troop leader told me. So I thought, well, what can I say? And I said, well, is there anybody else at your house that would buy Girl Scout cookies? And she, and she said, no. And I said, well, would it make somebody's day if you bought some cookies and gave them to them? And she said, yes. And, <laughs> But, but that was a really important skill because it taught me resilience, it taught me persistence. So in addition to realizing that I could create my own opportunities, it taught me that very important aspect of it, which is that resilience, that persistence that you need in life. And you know, recently I was out in Silicon Valley and I have this, um, I've, you know, because of Girl Scouting, I will say that I have this great opportunity that um, as, the inter as the interim CEO, any CEO of Girl Scouts gets to make their own patch. And my patch tells my Girl Scout story, which is I became a rocket scientist because of Girl Scouting. So my patch talks about how there's the stars that I got looked up in the sky so that my troop leader said, you should earn a science badge. So I earned a science badge making rockets, which is my rocket ship there. You see the nucleus, you see in the middle of the atom is the nucleus of Girl Scouting. And then I worked on the Voyager 2 mission, which uh, went by Jupiter and its moons Io and Europa. So as you look at my patch, this is not a cookie. <laughs> this is Jupiter, and you can tell because of the big red dot, and then my favorite uh, mathematical symbols. But you know, when I was out at Silicon Valley, they were we were talking about the STEM pipeline and the need for more women in STEM. And I was this big conference, 150,000 people. 80% of the women there were Girl Scouts. And when you think about in, you know, Silicon Valley and in a lot of industries like that, a lot of women don't stay, even though they've been trained in programming or engineering. But those things, those, le those lessons that you learn in Girl Scouts, persistence, resilience, realizing you can make your own opportunity, to me, it's no surprise. It's no surprise that there's a connection with those women that are in Silicon Valley. And there, well over 80% of the female executives in Silicon Valley were also Girl Scouts. So as you can tell, I love Girl Scouts. I believe green. And I want you know, to know that this, this impact, it changes lives forever. So it's not just my life or other women in technology. Almost every astronaut that's ever been into space was a Girl Scout. Half of America's elected officials, they were once Girl Scouts. And that's really not also a surprise because we have these civics badges, we have these, you know, get out the vote, having, finding common ground. So girls learn early on the importance of reaching out, finding common ground, how to use their voice in the public square. And when you grow up earning those badges, it's only natural that you want to go on and use your voice when you're running for, for office. So I'm not surprised. If you think about it, we're 8% of the girl population, but 80% of the female senators, Girl Scouts, majority of all the governors, Girl Scouts, and all three female secretaries of girl states, there are Girl Scouts as well. So when you're thinking about how can you change the world, how can you make a difference, I say invest in Girl Scouts because it has a lasting impact. We really do create girls of courage, confidence, and character that make the world a better place. And those are the kind of girls that grow up to be those women leaders. So I want to thank you for this time. I know I'm going to have a conversation, but I want to thank you for coming here, giving me the chance to say thank you, and also giving us the chance to experience wonderful Columbus that I know people are going to really love being here in October. So thank you very much. So I remember when I was a Girl Scout, people said to me that the first woman president will have been a Girl Scout. So we're still waiting on that, but we know it's going to be true. Um, <laughs> let me take a moment and introduce our first lady, who was also a Girl Scout, Karen Kasich. Um, Karen, please stand. Let everybody acknowledge you. So we won't tell the governor this, but we know he'd be nothing without Karen. <laughs> and <laughs> Karen came in in her Girl Scout green, and I said to her, I said, oh my god, you've got your Girl Scout green on. She said, yeah, I was toying with wearing the sash and the uniform, because I can still fit it. So for that, <laughs> for that we give her double kudos. <laughs> There are a few Girl Scouts or former Girl Scouts in this room that can say that. And just to point out, our Chief Justice was also a Girl Scout. So what you say about leadership and what Girl Scout teaches you, it really gives girls that power to step forward. 
So, now to talk to my friend Sylvia. And I promise to behave in my um, interviewing. But I, I thought we'd lead off with from what you started talking about, being that, that girl from humble beginnings in New Mexico. How does that girl from a low-income community, probably with not a lot of rocket scientists in her neighborhood, go from <laughs> that neighborhood in New Mexico to being a rocket scientist? Well, um, thanks for that question. You know, I hadn't made the connection between Girl Scouting and, you know, going into technical fields until um, in 2006, Stanford University Archives Department called me. And so when an archives department calls you, you feel really old, right? <laughs> like, oh my gosh. But they called me because they said, you know, we're looking at our records and you're one of the few, uh, you're one of the first Hispanic male or female to have ever gotten their graduate engineering degree from Stanford, but still one of the only. And they said, we want to know how it was that you got to be, you know, to be prepared that you could handle the academic rigor of Stanford. Because frankly, we didn't even recruit in southern New Mexico. So how was it that you even thought to go? And the more they asked me questions, I, they kept saying, well, so how did you develop an interest in science? How did you have that persistence? You know, it, it all came back to my Girl Scout experiences. My, you know, being a Girl Scout, having the uh, troop leader who encouraged me to earn a science badge, who taught me about looking at the stars. And it really gave me that confidence that I could do it. And so then when it came to be time to choose math, science, I always chose those different um, topics and subjects because I knew I had the confidence to do it. I had that, you know, courage, confidence. Um, and so that's kind of what it all started. And even when, like my guidance counselor told me girls like me didn't graduate from high school, girls like me didn't go to college, and girls like me didn't become engineers, I could confidently say, you know, I could do that because of my Girl Scout experience. That's awesome. And so was there that defining moment? Because I know we talk about the confidence that Girl Scouts gives us, but I can remember starting law school, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. I kept looking around at the other people in my class thinking, oh God, I don't belong here. I'm never going to make it through this first year. Did you have those feelings and how did you overcome them? Well, you know, um, I failed. And Girl Scouts taught me it was okay to fail. So the first rockets I made were not successful. Um, I was also doing it at the time when I was earning my cooking badge. Because you know, I wanted to be like all my friends, girl, right? I want to be like all my friends. So I'm earning the science badge, but I'm also gonna earn a cooking badge. And um, I tried making uh, peanut butter cookies. And the, in our family, we spoke Spanish, so the cookbooks were in Spanish. And so I misread one of the ingredients and I put a, a taza, a cup of salt into the peanut butter cookies. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that, that was a science experiment. <laughs> it didn't change the smell. It didn't actually change the look, but it did ta change the taste. Um, but after that, uh, we, we couldn't afford more peanut butter. My mom said, well, you got to make something out of what you have. And so we had um, flour, and we had Fleischmann's yeast, mm. and we had some um, tomato paste. So I said, we're going to make a pizza. And um, I read the directions. My mom asked if I needed help. I said, the directions are in English. I got this. I <laughs> remember that confidence? And so I read the directions. The Fleischmann G said warm water. And I thought, hmm, warm? I'm going to make it nice and warm. And so I poured boiling water on the Fleischmann's yeast. So I was waiting for the dough to rise, waiting for the dough to rise. <laughs> so then I went to my mom. And um, she said, oh, and then she taught me, it's got to be just a little uncomfortable on your wrist. That's the right temperature. She didn't ask if I needed help. She stayed and watched. Um, but then, you know, the dough did rise. And as I was punching it down, I had that moment, that aha moment of cooking is just like science. It's just like making my rockets. I had to read directions. I had to make sure I got the ingredients right. Got to make sure you got the heat right. Put all those things together, and you have success. And I did have you know, mistakes along the way. But it taught me, keep persisting, trial and error. And um, I had that aha moment. If I can cook, you know, I can do science. So that really helped me. Um, and then I had another moment of you know, crisis of confidence when I was going to go into engineering programs, and everybody was surprised because girls like me weren't, you know, being engineers. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be competing against Einsteins and just all these folks. And so I get into my first engineering classes, and those are the guys I did better than in school, in high school. So I'm like, eh, I could do this. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, that, those experiences gave me a lot of confidence to, get, to overcome. So in your, in your younger years, or maybe even now, when you were having those feelings or have those feelings of, 
I'm exhausted, I don't know if I can do this, or insecurity. Is there somebody that you turn to? I mean, who's your mentor? Who's that person that pushes you up the hill? Well, you know, uh, that's a good question. So, you know, obviously I had amazing troop leaders um, that were really encouraging, you know. Uh, my mom was really encouraging. My dad, the best as he could, we had a very traditional family, so he was not as, you know, uh, proactive, I think, in his support, one might say. Uh, so that really helped me uh, building my resilience muscle. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I also was hungry for anything about girls, so I read everything about Clara Barton in Florence Nightingale. Mm. And what I know, know now that I didn't know then was Florence Nightingale was an amazing systems engineer. She really was. Uh, amazing statistician. Um, she's the one that developed and figured out how to make charts to convey statistical information. So if you think back to when Florence Nightingale was, uh, was being active as a nurse, it was during the Boer War, and there were many people that were dying. And she was trying to say that her triage me methods would be better than what was currently being used. But she was a nurse, right? She was a woman. So they ignored her. And so then she decided to get data. You know, and again, at her time, they wouldn't even allow women to get into the statistical societies. So they said no. So she's like, I've got this great data. So she had the great leap of thinking, I'm going to hire a cartographer. So that's a map maker. And they made, and so she figured out, I need to visually represent data. And so that's why they're called charts. Do you ever wonder why on Excel they're called charts? Because she actually created, so if you go to a map maker, what do they make? They make charts, right? So she was one of the first people to have ever conceived of that thought. This chart, this is, shows you how nerdy I am, <laughs> is still considered to be one of the top three charts that changed the course of the, wor of the wow. world. And her statistical methods are still being used to this day in terms of our triage, mm -hmm. uh, save thousands of lives and change the course of the war. I read every, as you can tell, I read everything I could read about Florence Nightingale. And I think those kind of inspirational that, you know, she didn't immediately get a win. They kept telling her no, they kept telling her no. And the same thing with, with Clara Barton. Nice. So how do we change the discussion about girls, right? So you said that 8% of girls um, are in Girl Scouts. Yeah. And then what would you say, 80% of leaders? 50% uh, of all elected leaders, but like 80% of the U.S. senators. And so if, if we know that, like there's these commercials that are running, now. I don't know if you guys have seen them, they said, what if girls looked in the mirror and didn't look, talk about how they looked, but talked about being scientists or doctors or business people. If we know Girl Scouting and we know that it really be, builds leadership, it builds self-confidence, particularly at those ages where girls' attention may be turned to other more outward uh, appearances instead of what's in their brain, how do we, how can Girl Scouts lead? in changing that discussion? That's a really important uh, discussion. One of the parts of our website that gets the most traffic is called Raising Awesome Girls. And at all ages, that really becomes a very important point. Mm -hmm. Because you know, when, you're, when they're young, uh, you can influence them in a certain way. When they get older, it's really tough because bullying, social pressure comes on. And that's something we really look at quite a bit. We are looking to see how we can make Girl Scouts even more relevant on mobile devices. We will never get away from that in-person experience because that is absolutely you know, vital. But what we also know is you know, girls want to connect and collaborate connecting by their mobile devices. So those are things that we're trying to figure out how to do more of. The oh my God, the governor. The governor. I didn't mean uh, what oh I yeah. said. Oh yeah. <laughs> my wife uh, told me she was going to be here today and uh, that she's going to be very involved with the Girl Scouts. And I, I thought it was funny. And then she told me, she said, the lady who's going to be in here, you know, she's like, she like knows rockets. What am I going to talk to her about? <laughs> and, uh, and then she quickly gathered herself and said, I, I think I'm going to talk to her about about the books I've been reading. I think last year she read uh, f almost 50 books and she's constantly reading and educating herself uh, on things and you know uh, I thought I could just sneak over here and kind of <laughs> surprise her Yvette Judge. So I, I wanted to bring a couple things. First of all with the Metropolitan Club I actually don't think you've ever maybe you never have had, or had a resolution or be honored. Started by 13 women, all designed, really, frankly, the year of, of, of women empowerment. Do we need that more than ever? Yeah. We, we need that, and I believe in it. 
So I'm going to give this to, uh, to whoever it is should accept this resolution on behalf of the Metropolitan Club. And I have a real great self-interest because I need those 17-year-old twins of mine to be supporting dear old dad and mom, okay? Uh, so we want women empowered. But how about this, how about this woman, huh? I mean, they, they made a couple notes. You talk about hidden figures. Jet Propulsion Labs, worked on a Voyager, flyby of Jupiter, engineer at IBM, engineering master's degree at, St at Stanford. Couldn't get into Ohio State. Uh, <laughs> Served as executive at Apple, Autodesk, and Bell, and we're thrilled to have you uh, with the Girl Scouts because a, a couple reasons. One is we have, as you know, uh, Sylvia, there is a huge problem here with the coming tsunami of of digital, uh, the digital changes in this world, and our education system. I frankly do not believe. That, they, that it understands this wave that's coming our way. You know, the number one occupation in America is, a, is driving. And we're not going to be having a lot of drivers here in a short period of time. I was with the CEO of, of Siemens. He said that the changes that are going to come, uh, to give you an example, I was with a, a company really on the advanced side of, of auto, tier one manufacturer. They will not hire any engineers who work on combustion engines anymore. All engineers who are going to be hired are going to be hired who work on electronic mo electric motors. See, it's all going to change. And so what, do we, what are the jobs that are going to exist, and what is it that we can do to train people in a much different way than we currently are? Because the current system is not ripe for reform. We need to disintermediate a lot of our of our educational institutions to come up with new ways to prepare people with the skills so they don't find themselves out of work. So you're a perfect person to think about that as a head of a great organization and also to make it clear to women that you know, fight your way to the top. You're going to take any nonsense. I was at the Allen & Company in investment uh, uh, confab in Arizona, and you know the Allen & Company people. And I was there with Twitter and Facebook and PayPal and all these big executives. And the fact of the matter is most of the people in the room they're all men. What, do we somehow think that women can't figure this stuff out? That they can't be entrepreneurs and be involved in, in science and digital transformation? Of course they can. So for you to be able to give them the skills, to talk to them about acquiring those skills, and then on the other part of the, of the Girl Scouts, and the Boy Scouts, Boy Scouts for that matter, Yvette, is look, we can only do so much from the bottom, from the top down. We have to do more from the bottom up whether it's education, poverty, human trafficking, drug, fighting the drug problem. And if we can get all of our young women in this country to realize that if they change one life, they change the world, that's exactly where we want to be. And you're the perfect person to be there. So I brought you a little resolution that was hastily put together. But it, I, we're going to get you another one because it doesn't recognize the fact that you were a hidden figure and the incredible accomplishments that you have made and the fact that you, you happen to be part of a minority group. Mm -hmm. And you, make, you bring a great blend to America. So, so Sylvia, this is for you. And God bless you. And I will get out of the way before. Oh, 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 this is really cool. Look at this one, babe. OK, thanks for letting me interrupt. Wow. Well, that was fun. That was. Well, well, let me, this is an unexpected question, but let me pick up off of something yeah. the governor said, and that's this. I mean, one of the things we do see when we look at, as you go up the ladder of success, mm -hmm. right, there are fewer and fewer women in the room. So I would ask you, for, for young women out here who are beginning their careers or mid-level careers, how do they get? How do they climb that ladder? How do they have the confidence? Ursula Burns, who is the CEO of Xerox, started as an engineer, and she said she raised her hand once in a meeting, and she challenged the then president about something he said, and then he said to her, "Will you give me a better way to do it?" And then he started promoting her up through the company as she demonstrated more and more skills acquisition, more and more leadership. What's the secret to being in the room the governor just described? Oh, yeah, being in the room. <laughs> That's, you know, 
Um, I think uh, not taking no, that secrets of selling cookies, right? So when somebody says no, you start figuring out how, how do you make it a yes and how do you get in. Um, you know, um, networking is so important and I think a lot of women don't necessarily network. But also amplifying. Um, a lot of us with women, we've kind of uh, grow up being very competitive with one another and we take that into the boardroom or into business. And so we're sitting around a conference room table and you say a great idea and then a, a man will say that idea and then other people will build on his idea, but it was just yours. Right. But instead what you can do is have other women amplify your message. If you know Laura says something fan mm -hmm. fantastic and you say, you know, that's a great idea. Karen, I really like what, you know, I like what Karen said and build on that, you're amplifying one another's message. The other thing is we also often think we have to do it alone or we have to do it perfectly, mm -hmm. that you know, we can't fail. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you look at Silicon Valley, they kind of take a badge of, of honor that how many times they failed before they got it right. I think that's one of the great things I learned at Girl Scouts, it's okay to fail. And you keep trying, don't let that stop you. You know, failure is not, you know, is not just falling down, it's not getting up. And so those are types of things that, you know, being really determined. But the other thing too is I think a lot of times girls or women don't talk in the language of the business, we talk in, in the language of the subject. And uh, executives want to know, so you know, how does it affect the bottom line? We'll a lot of times focus on how it affects a department, how it affect, affects different people, Those, that's really important. But then how does it kind of lift up into the measurable results that the CEO is tracking? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we fail to make that connection and we get mad when the guy who just says it with some fancy business words, he gets promoted, but it was our hard work. So learning how to do that, and you don't have to do it alone. You can really reach out to other people to help them say, hey, help me understand, how could I say this better? What kind of financial implications does this have on the business? Help me understand that so that I can frame my remarks and my achievements in a way that matters to the business. And be willing to go out and get the skills you need, right? So oh, if you find absolutely. yourself to be at a skills deficit like Ursula Burns did as mm -hmm. she started to climb the ladder, you have to be willing to go out and get those skills. And to the point that you made about if you're the only woman in the room, I find humor works a lot. So I've been that woman in the room and you've said something and there's dead silence and then a man says it and everybody thinks it's a great idea. I will just pipe up and go, man, that sounds familiar. <laughs> you know? And <laughs> And then <laughs> it causes people to chuckle, right? But then you start to get credit for your idea, right? That's a brilliant idea. I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're, gonna, we're getting close to the question time. And so in a few minutes, I'm going to move the audience and ask you to give us questions. But I'm going to give one final thought before I ask you to line up. And I got to say, you're a pretty big deal. I've been at a lot of these metropolitan lunches. I've never seen the governor come in. <laughs> so. I think I <laughs> his wife. Thank you for coming, Harry. <laughs> so I guess if, if I were to ask you one last question before our audience members start to line up, it would be this. Um, what do you think is the most significant piece of advice you've ever received? Mm, that's a really interesting question. That's a great one. Um, you know, in addition to, you know, got to hear the three no's. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, um, it's kind of along the line, you could tell I was obviously into sales as well, is uh, the first sell is always to yourself. And that is, you've got to believe it. Because if you can believe it, then you can persuade people. But if you're asking somebody outside of you to validate you, it's not gonna happen. So the first sell is always to yourself. So that would probably be the other part of the advice. That, I love that. If you're raising girls, you just heard something profound. Because <laughs> the, the belief that they belong there and that yeah. they're as smart as anybody else in the room and it really is hard work and what I like to call sweat equity. Mm -hmm. That's really brilliant. So I'm not sure where the microphones are set up. Okay, so if you'd like to line up and ask a question, I'd like to just say to you though that it's, it's our tradition, CMC's tradition, to have audience questions. Please state your name, ask your question, and we thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments. You know, I was a former judge and I will cut you off. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. And actually, I don't have a question. I am with Girl Scout Troop 1480. Thank it's an inner city thing, uh, mixture of ethnic 
and diverse, racial diverse group of students, I just want to say thank you. Because of that, the kids have got to experience camp. They've experienced everything. They've been here for 15 years. Eileen and Ann Smith, they have been there every day for 15 years. I thank Tamala Collins for making it happen. You gave them an experience beyond the block, and I just want to say thank you all. We love thank Girl you. Scouts. Wow, thank, you. thank you. That is awesome. A, a lot of times, thank you for that question, a lot of times people don't realize that Girl Scouting has such tremendous reach into underserved and underrepresented communities. In Girl Scouts in the U.S. has over 187,000 African American girls in Girl Scouting, making us one of the largest African American youth serving organizations. We have over 204,000 Latinas in Girl Scouting. Again, I'm, I'm hard pressed to find another youth serving organization that has that many um, um, Latina girls. And we serve you know, all girls, of, regardless of their heritage, in, in poverty. Over a third of the girls in Girl Scouting are in low income Title I schools. So our reach goes to all girls. Yeah. I told Sylvia last night that my first plane ride was as a Girl Scout. Our Girl Scout troop was at Shiloh Baptist Church and I was 13 mm -hmm. and I was one of two girls from Columbus selected to go on a national leadership uh, trip to Oral Roberts University <laughs> in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> it could not have been more different <laughs> from where I grew up. But <laughs> But it was amazing because to be a 13-year-old kid from the inner city, never being on an airplane, uh -huh. but really being, seeing a college campus and being with other girls from across the country, it's what Girl Scouts gave me. So just, yeah. it's tremendous the work they do. Yes, yes sir. sir. Tony Guglamato. Um, I have uh, one question. First, I'd like to say uh, to Yvette and Sylvia, thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, you are uh, role models not only for women, but for also for men. Um, the question is, I know a little bit about Boy Scouts, and I know that boys that go to the top of the Boy Scout ranks and get their Eagle Scout badge and their Eagle Scout project. Can you tell me what the equivalent is in the Girl Scouts? Oh, thank you for that yeah. question. I love that question. It's called the Gold Award. And uh, yeah, you know, we need to do a little bit better marketing. So thank you for that uh, setup question. Uh, the great thing about the Gold Award, I like to say, it's actually a little bit harder to get than the Eagles, to earn than the Eagle Scout Award. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what a lot of folks don't realize is earning your Eagle Scout um, and also earning your Gold Award, top universities, universities across America, you're already put into the second round of admission. So think about in a very competitive environment, that is a massive advantage. And there are universities that you get full rides, scholarships. So I just spoke to a young woman in, uh, that goes to Columbia University in, in New York. She does not, her family has plenty of means, but she was a Gold Award win earner, and she has a full ride scholarship mm -hmm. in Columbia. So, and then also if you join the military, you join whether or Eagle Scout or a Gold Award earner, you, er, you start at a higher rank and higher salary. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that uh, just recently the um, Commandant of the Air Force Academy said he can always tell who's going to succeed. He says there's one trait. People think, oh, it's test scores, it's you know, experience in the military. It's, no, nope. were you a Girl Scout or were you a Boy Scout? Wow. That is a differentiator. Wow. Well, so thank you for the question. Next question. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Todd Kleismit. Uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife is here. Uh, she and I have an uh, eight-year-old daughter who's uh, an excited member of the Girl Scouts. Uh, we're very excited to hear from you, and thanks for all your enthusiasm for the the conference uh, that's going to take place in October. I wanted to ask if you could just elaborate a little bit more about the conference, what kinds of activities, and if there's a location in Columbus. Oh, it, it's you. going to be downtown at the convention center. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have this fantastic hall of experience that's going to be, you know, a lot with STEM, but, um, you know, a lot with digital because girls love that. We're going to have video screens all over, but so many hands-on experiences. Uh, Joanne Fabrics, a variety of, of companies are uh, going to be there, so girls can really try something. You know, we are working really hard to make sure that we can connect and collaborate on mobile devices, but we know the secret in the sauce is having those experiences, having those hands-on experiences. So we have them around the key focus areas of STEM, you know, entrepreneurship, healthy living. You know, those are the key things, lifestyles. Those are the things that we really are going to be uh, focusing on there. It's going to be fantastic. Really excited about it. 
Can you I, want to, Jamie, you want to add some additional ones? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm with, uh, this is my boss. Um, is yeah. she not amazing? I don't know. Um, so I'm selling the Hall of Experiences. There are still booths available. Mm -hmm. And so if you contact any one of the Girl Scouts that are here in the room, we'd happy to take your number and or anyone else within your reach that is interested in participating. We are here to uh, really make the world a better place, but also to bring this amazing event to Columbus. So. Um, reach out to someone within the Girl Scouts or Girl Scouts of the USA, we'd be happy to grab your information. Hey, thank you. And can I put in a plug for legal, please? Because I get STEM, uh -huh. but listen. <laughs> <laughs> we need more women lawyers. Yeah. And uh, everybody, every magnet school is on STEM, and it's great yeah. that we're doing science, technology, education, and math, but I need little girls who can read uh -huh. and think and analyze and who want to grow up to be lawyers. And so as you're looking at the, the hall of experiences, include a legal uh, hall in there. I think so that we can get them. One, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Chief Justice. I just turned to Tammy and said, during your convention, we will organize tours of the Supreme Court building, which is right between you two ladies on the backdrop. Awesome. And we'll participate in the program. There, there you go, the Chief Justice. Yay. Next Hi. question, please. Hi, um, my name is Max and Keith, and I'm with Troop 673, and um, I'm a cadet, and I have a question. What is your favorite Girl Scout cookie, and how many boxes would you like to buy? <laughs> cookies from you and uh, I'm, I'm not supposed to have a favorite <laughs> you know that's not true right they don't make you think for me that, that is just creative marketing uh -huh. yeah, thank you I will buy some from you yes uh, Buenas tardes, señora. Gracias por estar aquí hoy. Okay. My name is Susie, uh, and I work at Battelle. I'm a mechanical engineer there. Oh, nice. I recently graduated, and I'm new to Columbus. And my question to you is, what do you do? Everybody talks about when you go into work and industry, don't be afraid to fail, and don't be afraid to raise your voice. But what happens when you do that, and then you actually fail, and then you're like, oh, I just messed that up real bad. <laughs> Uh, because that recently happened to me, and I remember just being really, I was like, everybody talks about trying and not being afraid, and then I remember messing up, and I was like, oh, that was really bad. What do I do to fix it? Oh, and okay. luckily, I had a really, I have a really good leader and a lead mechanical engineer that helped me through it, but I'm wondering what happens when girls don't have that? How do you, how do you? recover from those situations. Well, great, I love your enthusiasm. I'm glad you're a mechanical engineer, yay. Um, um, you know what, failure is part. Um, you know, there are also, um, when you make a mistake, you have to own up. You know, that's just so important. And so don't try to dodge it, you know, own it, and then go about resolving it. And don't just make it somebody else's problem. You made a mistake, now it's somebody else's problem. You own the mistake, take responsibility, and then you work on solving it. That's what I would recommend, right? Learn from your mistakes. Failure is part of learning. Yep, it is. Thank you so and much. leadership, yep. yep, thank you. If you ever read Sheryl Sandberg's book, guys act like they never failed, right? They failed and they just get up and be like, whoo, okay, moving on to next. You just gotta push it back and go forward. Yes, ma'am. Hello, hello, Kathy Lowry Gallowitz. Today's a perfect storm for me, ladies and gentlemen. I am a first class Girl Scout. Yay. A member of the Girl Scout Seal of, Ohio, Heart, Seal of Ohio's Heartland. Yay. A longtime member of Columbus Metropolitan Club. All right. Yay. So, because you brought up the military, I'm also a 30 year Air Force veteran. Okay. Because you brought up military, and really, I am really interested in trying to draw more and more women into military service. I believe that Girl Scouting gave me the foundation mm -hmm. for going into military service. Everywhere I go, I hear about women lawyers or women physicians or you know successful women IT people, but people don't ever talk about successful women in the military. You agree? Mm -hmm. We just don't hear about it. So <clears throat> as a current board member and someone who's gonna be an advocate of Girl Scouts for the rest of my life. What are your thoughts on that? How can we partner together to really help the female citizens of America fully embrace this awesome leadership and career opportunity? You're absolutely right. So first of all, thank you for your service. You know, thank you very much for that. 
You know, that, that is um, something that we're very much uh, wanting to work with all the branches of government, uh, especially in the Defense Department, to figure out how can we do a deeper reach into Girl Scouting by working with the different departments of defense? Because, you know, it is a, a national security issue. It really is. And so um, I'm definitely on your wavelength on that, and we're trying to figure out how can we do some additional work. Okay, I would appreciate that, so thank you. We have another question. Hi, I'm Toby Furman, and I wanted to let, you know, to the question of include the military, what about the arts? STEM to STEAM. Steam yeah. You can't forget about the arts. It's an opportunity of a lifetime for many, many kids, especially sometimes low income. So yeah. in your conference and as you explore your, you know, evolution, don't leave out the arts. Oh, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, and we're working on an, uh, a national um, uh, rollout where we will actually do um, hands-on STEAM um, around the country, giving girls an opportunity of, how do you, you know, like think about wearables, you know, putting technology into fabric. I mean, just all sorts of great stuff like that. Uh, we're really looking at that. And we're working on reimagining your, your affiliation with Girl Scouts. So think about girls. We have sashes. We have your, you know, your badges. You've got your uniform. We're, we're really trying to think in the age of digital, how do you reinterpret your affiliation? So we're really thinking a lot about arts and fashion. I'm going to make a plug for something that I've been working on. I'm <laughs> developing a program called the Art Mobile. Uh -huh. And it's an art studio on wheels for low income in our distressed neighborhoods here in Columbus. So right. if I have it all together, I'd be glad to show up for your conference. Okay, well, you know the people it's here. It's going to be outside, so it'll be on the bus. Yeah. But okay. good luck, and I you know, love Girl Scouts. Thank you. I was a Girl Scout myself. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Thank you. You're one of those entrepreneurs. Hi, and it's such a pleasure to know you, at least to hear to hear you talk. Uh, also, I want to say that I'm very proud that we're new to this country, and my daughter is in her second year uh, in Girl Scouts. Uh, I'm a PhD with Ohio State, um, and what you said earlier with the 8% enrollment of the girls in United States um, in the Girl Scouts, it's, um, I wonder for, not necessarily for you or for you, Judge, but for everybody, what can we do uh, to spread this? My daughter it loves it. I love it because it helps me acculturate her, um, and, and it takes away from pressure of being a mom because the troop leaders are so supportive and she gets so much from the troop itself but how can the other 92 percent or you know we can raise the percentage of the girls being enrolled with such uh, awesome outcomes well I, I thank you very much and tammy where's tammy did she leave? there she is see her she she wants to talk with you because it's very much we want you know what our girl scout mo uh, our model when you think about it is girl potential and then pro you know programming skills and that's where most youth organizations stop but what makes us different and what has these lifetime outcomes is that we have two other parts which is the girl scout leadership experience because when you learn something we ask you to do something you may learn about civics but then we're going to ask you to do something in your community in your park you know it, it, make it a better place if you learn about technology we ask you to go make a robot. You've got to do something with it. So the Girl Scout leadership experience is a really important part. But the fourth part of our model, which is something you refer to, is it's always under the auspices of a caring adult. That's a volunteer who says, I want to make sure your girl potential is developed as fully as possible. And you, we're so grateful for all of our troop leaders because we know they care about their daughters, but they also care about those other girls. And they try to make sure that their skills are developed, their potential is fully developed. And I think that's why you have such great outcomes. And Tammy's always looking for additional volunteers. You don't have to run a troop by yourself. Uh, it can really, uh, you can do it with four or five friends and, um, and, and run the troop. And then on a personal level, you mentioned you were new to the U.S. My family, we, uh, my mom was from Mexico. All my grandparents were from Mexico, one of 13. But my troop leaders, um, they really adopted my mom. They took her under their wing, and they helped her learn English. They helped my mom um, take citizenship lessons, because you know my father kind of traditional. He wasn't necessarily telling her she was eligible to become a U.S. <laughs> citizen. And they helped her 
uh, apply and pass the citizenship test. So for me, one of my proudest moments was when I was flying up from Brownie to Junior, my mother was flying up as well, and she was becoming an American citizen. Nice. So I know that wouldn't have happened without Girl Scouts. So yeah, it has a big impact. So thank you for that question. Hi, I'm Essie Pacetta, and thank you so much for being here. I feel really honored, and I truly have a front row seat, so it's been such a pleasure. Uh, my question for you, or I guess my, my brief, brief, brief editorial is uh, from, you know, the age of 18 when I went to college and graduated, uh, pursued my degree, graduated as an engineer, but went directly into sales from now I am 29, and I feel like I'm kind of zigzagging all over the place. My question for you of somebody who I feel like is also a zigzagger is how do you know or how do you know how do you find out what you're going to be when you grow up? Uh -huh. wow. Or what you so, should do. You know, I'm a problem solver and um, so I always um, did things that interested me and solved those problems and that was really uh, powerful. Um, and, um, and, and I also really got into studying the organization, so I didn't just always try to make a sales quota or whatever. Or I tried to see what were the problems the company was having and how could I be part of solving them. That opened up so many doors of opportunity uh, for me. And then when I, um, I ended up joining a company and we sold it, and then I started working in nonprofit world, I realized I could use my powers of analytical skills, understanding demographics, understanding scalable solutions, so you could re reach thousands of, of kids one-on-one. -on -one. But that was using my engineering. But I did that around solving a problem. So that's kind of how I went about it. I'm also going to do a shameless plug. Uh, on LinkedIn, I'm going to ask you all to uh, put your connection on LinkedIn and Girl Scouts, if you would. Um, you can get the story of my patch on LinkedIn. And also, I have a bunch of patches if you want one. I, I've got one for you. Uh, but LinkedIn did a survey. And again, it's self-reported data. So we don't know how accurate it is. But 90% of the women making more than $100,000 a year on LinkedIn were Girl Scouts. Wow. Had a Girl Scout affiliation. It's powerful. So wow. thank you. Well, can I give you one more thing? Yes. Engineers make great patent lawyers. <laughs> they really do. And there are few women in patent law. <laughs> uh, wait, oh. <laughs> yeah, but patent lawyers make a lot of money. <laughs> um. <laughs> Especially IP. Especially yes, IP patent lawyers that's right. in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Sherry Lynn Wynn, and it's a pleasure to spend the afternoon with you during this lunch period. I'm a change agent within youth development here within the city. I'm also the mother of three girls and the, mother, uh, and the grandmother of one girl. I have two graduating from college this year, so I'm really excited about that. I don't exactly have a question. Oh, and I was also a Brownie and a Girl Scout, woo! Yeah. But what I do want to say is when we were talking about failure a little earlier, I have two really good quotes that I've really, really stood on throughout my life with failure. And number one is, you never fall down, you always fall up. Mm -hmm. And the next one, which comes from my mentor, Judy Barker, and it's, it ain't no hill for a climber. So if you fail, look at those two quotes and pick yourself back up and keep on moving. It's not gonna be easy, but when you have ladies like you leading us and mentoring us, it's gonna be all right. Well, Thank only you. because you were the last one will I not chastise you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and now, First of all, let me say to Sylvia, thank you. Oh, thank she, you. she is so wonderful, and to have you in our community and to have you leading Girl Scouts, for all of us, it's a thrill. So thank you for spending time with us the thank last two days. Thank all of you for coming here, and see you in October. And, and before you leave, we have a special announcement that has not come out yet. If you were wondering why Karen Kasich is here, it's because she's agreed to be the honorary chair of Girl Scouts of Ohio's Heartland, our local council, for 2017, and she's going to welcome our guests here to the convention in October, so we're delighted to have her part rejoining the Girl Scout family uh, this year, throughout the year, and leading up to convention. So thank you so much. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's forum. As a mother of two Girl Scouts, I know I did. We encourage you to continue the conversation with coffee and cookies in the back. 
You can view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Please help me thank our partners, Girl Scouts of Ohio's Heartland and the Women's Fund of Central Ohio, and our speakers, Sylvia Acevedo and Yvette McGee-Brown. And thank you to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you again soon at another forum, maybe even this Friday. All right, thank you. <laughs>